is probably the most irrelevant intro to a video ever, but I got a mandolin and I'm super happy about this. Hello, my friends. In this video, we're going to talk about a question that I keep getting all the time. And I mean all the time. It's one of the things that I get asked on every workshop that I do. I get asked about this uh, from artists that I work with. And this burning question is, does it make sense to buy analog gear in 2024. Is there really a point? The plugins are so good, right? So in this video, I'm going to give you my honest opinion about analog gear. And I hope that if you're starting your journey and you're thinking about analog gear, this video might help you figure out if analog gear is for you and if you should invest. I want to get something straight out of the way. I have loads of analog gear, but I want to think that I'm not bias because I've been working as a producer, as a mixing engineer, as a composer for a long time. And for a long time, I didn't have analog gear. So that means that I can tell you straight away that you can do amazing music, you can do amazing mixes, you can even do mastering without any analog gear. If that's enough for you, you can stop watching. But if you want to learn a little bit of why I have so much, then keep watching. Now, I want to say straight away, this video is not sponsored. I have no agenda about uh, you buying or not buying analog gear. This is entirely my own opinion. This is what I would say to a friend. So that's what I'm gonna do today. I'm going to have a conversation with you. So I want to start with the premise is that nowadays plugins are indeed very powerful computers are powerful enough to run great plugins and if you want to create a full song without any piece of analog gear apart from of course like an interface because you would need something to record into or to listen from you don't need analog gear to make a great record However, I am going to tell you where I found that analog gear does make a difference. And this comes from many years of experience producing, mixing, recording. So the first thing I want to say that analog gear does make a difference is during the recording stage. And let me explain. One of the ways that uh, I found analog gear has a tremendous impact on a recording, on a song, is when you have a singer in the studio and you want to record their voice. I'm talking about singers because vocals is maybe the most important element on many music genres. If you're working with singers, if you're working with guitarists, if you're working with instrumentalists that want to have a great sound on their headphones so that they can give you the best performance that they can, then analog gear I found makes a difference. And I'm going to give you examples here. When I have a compressor on the way in, like an LA-2A, a real LA-2A, or a CL-1B that from what I hear, these things are on waiting lists and people are waiting for ages to get one of these. There's a reason why so many people want the Tube Tech and the LA-2A and the 1176. This is because when you're recording a singer and you run their voice through this, it gives them confidence. It allows them to perform in a much more fluent way. Most most of the times I prefer to not record with compression, but when I record with compression, I insist that this compression is analog, like a real tube tech, a real LA-2A, or any compressor that works for you. Why? Because if you know how to use these pieces of gear, it's very rare that you're going to mess up the sound on the way in that it's going to be irreversible and you want to undo it. So I don't worry at all when I'm using a CL-1B or an LA-2A on the way in. I know it's going to do something great to the sound. It's going to give the sync a little bit of confidence and this is so important. The most scary thing for singers is when they wear the headphones and they listen to their voice completely naked with all the dynamics and you know they try to go a little bit louder and it screams in their ears and they're like oh I'm too afraid I'm going a little bit too loud there and they immediately start feeling tense. Feel like oh, I'm not good enough or I want to do this again and I can tell you from experience whenever I add a tube tech or an LA-2A or or an 1176, every single singer feel much better about their performance and they tend to give you a much better performance. This does make a difference to the final output, to the final piece of art that is music. And for this, I find that analog gear is still not only relevant, but even a good idea to invest in. Also, it's going to make mixing down the line 
way easier. If you run something through these compressors, especially vocals, 99% of the times you need to compress. Well, do it on the way in so that the singer can also feel much better and they can adapt their performance to the compressor, which is also something that we don't consider sometimes. An analog recording chain is always going to be relevant. The second reason, again, I think it's very underestimated, and this is an entirely psychological reason. This is absolutely real, and if you don't take this into account, I think you don't want to see the reality. So the reality is that when I'm working with an artist and they come to my studio, back in the day, you know, when I was starting out, I had like some affordable mics. The singer would come in and they would see this mic and they would be, what's this mic? I'm not sure, I've never seen this mic before. And they're already a little bit suspicious, they're a little bit uneasy, they're a little bit, oh, it's the mic's fault, it's not my fault. But when you present them with a Neumann U87, for example, they already feel okay, it's safe. This is the industry standard, this mic is great. If I don't deliver, it's not the mic, it's me. Most of the times, it's not the case. I know many affordable mics out there that are 150 bucks and they can deliver great sound. And for some singers, these microphones might work better than a Neumann U87. So sometimes I'm going to present them with a U87 first and I'm gonna say, can we try this mic? And then it's much easier to get a great performance because they've tried the expensive one, but they can see that the cheaper one might be better. And the same goes for gear. I know that for some artists, seeing an Avalon 737 is going to make them feel this is the real deal, I feel comfortable right now. Same when it comes to mixing. You might have some clients and you might be mixing for them and they might see an API, they might see a manly passive, they might see a distressor, they might see an 1176 and immediately they feel confidence. They feel that, okay, I'm going to get a good result out of this. Now, of course, you need to know how to use all these things. I'm not saying that these things are magic on their own, but the psychological factor is an important one and we can't underestimate it. Music is a very human gesture. Whatever makes you feel good to deliver the best performance or to feel comfortable, it helps. Now, in no way I'm suggesting that you go and spend 100K on gear just for the psychological factor, but it depends on what stage you are on your professional journey. If you're starting out, it makes no sense. Don't spend 10,000 pounds on an EQ. It's not gonna do you any good. But if you're at a stage where you have loads of customers, you have a business to run, you want to provide your customers the last 5% of this quality that you can't get anywhere else, and of course all this gear is going to be expensive for your business, so that means tax reductions as well, then it makes sense to choose your gear wisely. Now let's talk a little bit about mixing and mastering. I think that when it comes to mixing and mastering, analog gear does make a difference. Especially for mixing, I found that the differentiator is that you can get to the sound quicker compared to, let's say, a plugin. So for example, I have the MC77, which is an 1176 style compressor that emulates the original. I have the plugin as well. I use both. Why? Because the plugin can get me maybe 90% there. The plugin is incredible, but if I hadn't used the hardware to compare, I wouldn't know that I was missing this 10%. And also this 10% is very obvious when you have a full mix. If you do an AB with completely naked tracks, you might be able to hear the difference, but it's not gonna justify the amount of money that you have to spend for the hardware for this, where in the mix, in my opinion, this is where things change because you hear the plugin and then you hear the hardware and then the hardware sounds richer, it sounds bigger, it sounds more 3D. But then, if you know how to use plugins, it's very easy to add a little bit of extra things, you know, with some other plugins, some additional saturation or something like this, to emulate this behavior that the hardware gives you. It's gonna take you five more minutes. But are these five more minutes important to you? This is the big question. For me as a professional, it makes sense. It really makes sense to also have the hardware because I can use it for recording. I can also use it for mixing for maybe the hero track, my lead vocal or my lead guitar or maybe the snare or something like this. But maybe for backing vocals, I'm going to use the plugin. Now, when it comes to mastering, things are a little bit different. With mastering, I tend to be very particular with my choices. Especially Especially when I do analog mastering, I do both in the box and analog and hybrid. When I do analog mastering, I want every piece of gear in my chain to be the top of the top. So an EQ will make a difference, a compressor will make a difference, the limiter will make a difference, the converters will make a difference. Because with mastering, you're treating the final product. You want to have 
even this extra 10, 5, 1% that you can get from analog gear. The hardware allows me to get there super, super quickly. It's not a coincidence. If you go and check out master classes from big mixing and mastering engineers, you will see that many times, especially for mixing, mixing engineers have a set of 1176 with different settings and they almost have them there as presets. So they just run the audio with the correct gain staging, of course, but then they have these settings and they're glued with these settings. They don't go and change them. That's why sometimes the 1176 might be at the corner of the room. Most of these engineers won't go there with headphones most of the times and not be in their sweet spot of their monitors and go and tweak the 1176. They know that this setting works for vocals. They know that this setting works for snare or for kick drum. And this is how they use their hardware. Which brings me to my next point, which is that hardware has a super wide sweet spot. You can go to a tube tech CO1B, do some settings, leave it there and you can't really mess up the sound where if you try and do something similar on a plugin, sometimes you will find that you have to be way more precise with your settings. So actually when you're using plugins, you should have a much better trained ear and you should be a more experienced mixing engineer to be able to find the sweet spot in plugins than non-linearities of the hardware. Sometimes it's really hard to emulate in plugins. For example, I've done a video about the black box, the HG2, and I've compared it to the plugin and yes, the plugin is amazing, but the hardware is magical, especially when you start pushing it. This is another thing that hardware does so well. When you push the hardware, most of the times it results in a very pleasing saturation, distortion or inclusion of harmonic content to your track. Where some plugins, especially older plugins, when you push them, they don't sound so nice. They sound harsh. The distortion sounds not pleasant. And again, there are many exceptions. And if you want to find out which the exceptions are, I've made tons of videos about plugins. And this is because I love plugins. It's a huge part of my workflow. And I'm always going to keep investing in plugins because they've come a long way. And sometimes they do things that haven't been done before. And the last thing is, again, a psychological thing. And it's a human thing, I have to say. And it's the actual gesture of touching a piece of gear, moving the knobs, and immediately with no latency, something happens. It might not be the case with you, but for me, using knobs instead of the mouse is so important. It really makes me feel more creative, makes me work faster, makes me make decisions based on my ears and not my eyes, which is what it should be, in my opinion. Sometimes, myself included, get so obsessed about, oh, how does a plugin sound? What does it do in the background? Let's analyze it and all these things, and then we forget about the main thing that we're supposed to be serving here and right here we're serving the art of music. We want to have a result that's artistic, that we can relate to, that can make people dance, make people cry, make people happy. Yes, we're geeks. Yes, we want to see what happens under the surface of every plugin or a piece of gear. But in the end, when somebody listens to your music, nobody's gonna care if you use the plugin that had oversampling or if it had auto gain or if you use a piece of hardware. What about the music? This is what we should care about. The same goes for synths, you know? What drives me to real hardware synthesizers is that I can wake up in the morning, go in the studio, turn it on, start playing and I can come up with a track. At the end of the day, if you walk into your studio and you have one single piece of uh, analog gear and this makes you feel creative, this makes you feel engaged to create music, to create art, to mix, to master, to produce. For me, this is a reason enough to get some analog gear if it makes you feel like this. So I hope this answers your question and especially if you're starting out, I hope this helps you a little bit. In my opinion, if you're starting out, don't worry about analog gear. Don't feel that you're missing out. Try and make the best out of all the things that you have. I've said this in previous videos. I started with a super humble setup like 25 years ago and I created five albums with this. I was recording my band with this setup and I had zero analog gear. But of course, when I started making my first money out of music, then the first thing that I wanted to do was to invest in something that I knew it was going to make a difference for me. So there you go. Well, my friends if you enjoyed this video as always you know what to do like subscribe because i do a lot of these videos and use the super thanks button if you feel like it and if you want to support the channel you can also check out my instruments the modern 80s drum kit max or the apollo expansion for patch up if you're into cinematic music and you might also be interested in this video or this video let me know your thoughts down below i'll see you in the next one
拜。